We have been fortunate enough to visit a true paradise full of life. Water, air, sun, diversity of aquatic life, land animals, birds, flowers of untold colors, forests, oceans, wonders of nature. Unfortunately, we have not been able to care for our greatest treasure, Mother Earth. Without regards to our conscience, in pursuit of our lust for power and wealth, we've been irreparably damaging the environment. This is not a matter of fashion, much less media fanfare. It's reality. The trafficking of wildlife has become one of the most lucrative businesses in the world. In the first part of this program, we will look at how this problem affects our country of Colombia. How various environmental and police agencies rescue wild animals in captivity and how they work. Public and private entities to rehabilitate them and later set them free. Two of the species currently in danger of extinction as a result of wildlife trafficking are the blue-billed curacao, or Colombian turkey, a bird that is only found in this country, and the lime green macaw. ¿Conoce usted estas especies? The macaw, yes, not the curacao. The green macaw, yes, but not the other one. ¿Sabía que se encuentran en peligro de extinción? Well, it's very well known in the country that we didn't know it was in danger of extinction. Sir, I didn't know. No, no. Tráfico de fauna silvestre. Una amenaza para la biodiversidad. Segunda parte. The green lime macaw appears on the endangered species list published by the International Union for Nature Conservancy. One of the main problems for the macaw is the illegal trafficking of wildlife. They are very noticeable animals, and culturally, we have always kept birds on our farms, like parrots and macaws, probably because even though they cannot speak like us, they make similar sounds, sounds like those humans make. It is very common to keep them in our homes. Also, touching on the theme of the feather trade, they are trafficked also because of this. Another threat that these animals face is the destruction of habitat, above all, the cutting down of trees for the cultivation of crops. So, as a result, they are losing many different types of trees where the birds reproduce. The blue-billed curacao faces a series of threats. Nearly all animals are also entering this critical stage because of climate change. Currently, the main threat faced by the blue-billed curacao is hunting. This uncontrolled activity has unleashed a rapid decline in their population. That's why it has been classified by the UICN as a species in critical danger. Many people that live in the countryside, peasants, don't have many sources of protein in their diet, or for various reasons, they have no hens. They begin hunting the curacao because it greatly resembles a hen, and it is a large enough bird, it has enough musculature, and it can be eaten. Besides that, and the fragmentation of their habitat, its destruction. They're destroying the ecological niches where these native species live. They are not found anywhere else in the world, so the cutting down of forests, the construction of new roads, the destruction of forests for agricultural purposes, this causes critical stress on their well-being, on this species' ability to live in its natural state. Inside the Santa Fe Zoo, 
we have a section where we display lime green macaws. The individuals that we see here are F2 individuals, meaning second generation. They are more or less the grandparents of the specimens with which we started the program. We have an exhibition area because the idea is to show the whole public the conservation of processes that we're doing with the macaws. It's an educational platform. These macaws belong here. We trim their feathers in such a way that they can't fly away. And in the lower part, in the conservation and reproduction area, we have the already established couples. These have been proving to be viable couples, and their reproductive process is supervised. They have a special diet depending on the reproductive stage they find themselves in. We give them corn, we feed them eggs, papaya, banana, and we give them mango. They have two types of diets. We have to supplement their calcium to make the eggs they lay viable. Tráfico de fauna silvestre. Una amenaza para la biodiversidad. We have couples in each one of these modules. In total, we have seven couples. We can only tell them male and female apart through DNA tests, since there is no visible difference between males and females, and it's very difficult to tell a male apart from a female. Some articles have been written that say that you can tell through morphological characteristics, that say that maybe you can tell them apart if they have a bigger head or extremities, but we cannot be 100% sure. So every time we put couples together, we have to test for sex. It is said that macaws choose a mate for life. Scientific studies have demonstrated that in certain occasions, when one of them dies, the other one can find a couple and thus continue to reproduce. There is a nest in each of the modules. The nest also has to meet some international standards, a specific location, the diameter of the hole, and inside the nest there is a substrate that has to have an optimal height and have a material that is preferably sawdust, husks, or some type of foliage as a substrate where they can lay their eggs. In terms of reproduction, there are two laying seasons in the year. One in the first semester, and right now, at the end of the second semester. Normally, each macaw couple lays two or three eggs. Usually two are viable, and they remain inside the nest until the moment they shed their plumage. We set them loose on the wild with the accompaniment of the environmental authorities that help us in the rehabilitation of animals that are confiscated or handed in by people who primarily keep them at their farms or houses. That is the rehabilitation process. It's basically like trying to rehabilitate a drug addict or an alcoholic. It takes a long time to help them to adapt to their natural behavior, their mate, their diet, all of these behavioral aspects, and then we proceed to release them. Once they are released, we continue with monitoring and follow-up because when you release an animal, you have to follow through so that the result will be successful. As a necessary prerequisite to set them free, we must conduct a series of exams and medical, nutritional and behavioral tests on the animal. The animal has to undergo these series of exams to determine if he is viable and if the release is going to be successful. So, if the animal develops a high degree of imprinting, and by that we mean getting too attached to a human or becoming unaware of predators, then release is impossible. Then, before they are set free, we make a special paddock where they will be let go. We build platforms of the same type where they can form groups where they get used to feeding, where we introduce them to predators so we can evaluate their behavior in light of these factors and to ensure the survival of these individuals. Up until now, the Santa Fe Zoo has not yet carried out the first release of a lime green macaw. It is hoped that in the near future, many of these animals that have participated in the conservation project will regain their freedom and successfully return to the wild, to their natural habitat.
The species as such manifest sexual dimorphism, which means there is a difference between males and females. The primary difference that we will find between male and female is in the size of the animal. There is also male-specific coloring in the belly or the lower part. The feathers are white. In the females, their feathers in the belly and the tail are brown. The majority of curassows, as I explained before, always have these types of differences. The male is also characterized for having a bulb in the lower part of the beak. And depending on their age, the crest will be more pronounced in the female. In broad strokes, those are the characteristics that this species of curassow displays, because in other curassows there is a very different coloration of the plumage. Unlike macaws, curassows are not monogamous, meaning that they can have different reproductive partners throughout their life. Reproduction is somewhat difficult for individuals living in their natural state. And speaking of individuals in captivity, they have very specific gestation stages. The courtship is very peculiar, because the male will always try to woo the female by giving her food. As the breeding season begins and the female starts to ovulate, she will begin to display behaviors typical of the species. So the male starts to make her gifts, such as little pebbles and certain types of food, trying to conquer the female, and then they begin building the nest. Tráfico de fauna silvestre, una amenaza para la biodiversidad. One strategy that was implemented to achieve curacao reproduction in captivity was to make the space as natural looking as possible by introducing elements that will allow them to build their nests. This will help those males that have started on this labor to obtain the acceptance of females. Those over there are making their nests themselves, and that's not common to see them making their nests in captivity. Out in the wild they do, but in captivity they don't build the nest themselves. And the curacaos here are doing it themselves, and we're happy because it's an achievement, and we hope that they will lay eggs soon. We are anxiously waiting for it to happen. Another critical issue for this species is that there is a fungus that attacks the eggshells and it hurts them. We do not have that type of problem here in captivity with curacao eggs. Reproduction for this species is a difficult affair. Reproductively speaking, their courtship is time-consuming, and the breeding season in this species can vary a bit, and their population is decimated because of hunting. These factors all affect the reproduction of this species. After being hunted for so long, the natural population of this species is deteriorated. The seizures that are being carried out by the environmental authorities or by the Colombian police are not the only way to give these wild animals another opportunity in life. Thanks to the work of education and consciousness raising about the consequences of having wild animals as pets, every day many people decide to voluntarily give up the animals they keep in their homes. Do you know where the parrots came from? These parrots are sold by a man in front of my job. We have had the parrot here for a while, so we decided to donate him to animal protection, where he could remain in its habitat with his friends. I give him all kinds of fruit, and my grandmother taught him to eat leftovers. Rice, chicken bones, meat, everything. We thought that the best thing for him was to be where he's supposed to be. She knows how it is. 
Come here, Lorencito. Wait, carry him on the stick. He won't fly away? No, she doesn't fly. She doesn't have large wings or she would have flown away. I recommend that you do not have them at home, that you take them to their natural habitat for the well-being of the animal. Thank you for bringing in the bird. Sure, I always told Camilo, look how sad she is, locked up all day, and she's very disobedient. I put myself in her shoes and, yes, if you love these animals, you must give them the opportunity to be free. We are now at the headquarters of the Wildlife Center for Attention and Evaluation, or the CAE. This is where we bring the animals that we recover when we make the rounds in the rescue units. After they go through a quarantine period where we perform all of the necessary treatments, if they are injured, we treat them or if we have to administer some type of medication or perform some procedure, we do it and move them to these cages where we feed them a diet similar to what they will receive in their natural habitat. Tráfico de fauna silvestre, una amenaza para la biodiversidad. The Wildlife Center for Attention and Evaluation, or CAE, provides animals with wide spaces where they can recover and reacquire their wild behaviors and adequate physical condition. One of the most important goals is to make sure that at the end of this process, they will behave as if they have never been in captivity. That way, they will be ready to be released in the various areas around the country where they belong. For us, the greatest satisfaction is to release animals. Knowing that an animal that has been in captivity for one, five or ten years in a residence can regain its abilities or can find a mate and will be released to its natural environment, that is a great satisfaction for us. For us, that is the real payoff for the work that we do. It's the satisfaction of seeing an animal take flight and regain its freedom, or seeing a wildcat go into the jungle. It's the best feeling you can get as a professional in this field. The fundamental point is not to hunt this species. Very few individuals in Colombia know that this species can only be found in Colombia. And no matter what a person's protein needs may be, we should not hunt these animals to satisfy human dietary needs. There must be other alternatives for human consumption. We can develop sustainable activities that double as conservation strategies. That is, we should not cut down more forests because that is where they nest most of the time. And it's a threat that we are currently seeing not just in rural areas, but also here throughout the whole Aburra Valley. It's important to not encourage trafficking in wildlife. We should not buy or sell or trade in wild animals much less macaws, no matter how colorful they might be, or even if we want to help. It's simply not good for them because we really don't know much about their behavior or how these animals should be treated. Let's take stock and always keep in mind that wild animals are not pets. They have certain functions that they perform in the ecosystem. They're excellent at distributing seeds and controlling plagues. When we take them out of their natural habitat, we are creating an imbalance. We are altering their normal functioning of the environment. Take the case of a parrot in captivity, which stops spreading seeds as it does during its normal life. If you assume that she stops planting a tree every day by not spreading seeds, that's 365 trees in a year. 
And if we multiply that by an average of 10 years, which is their average lifespan in their natural habitat, we're talking about 3,650 trees it won't plant in its lifetime. And if we add to that the offspring that they may have every year, then that number becomes huge. So even with just one little animal, you are opening a huge hole in the ecosystem. And this is the only planet we have. And if we don't take care of this planet, we have nowhere to go. The idea is for us not to keep wild animals. First, because of what I just told you about the biological functions they perform. But second, because they are protected by law and owning them is illegal. So having one of these animals is a crime and could carry fines, monetary fines and criminal sanctions. So for us to avoid problems with the authorities, let's not keep wildlife in our houses. Also, keeping pets because they are pretty and colorful or have pretty eyes is a terrible tradition here in Colombia and that we prize their beauty by locking them up and keeping them in a cage. Animals, just as humans, have a right to find a mate to reproduce and to propagate the species. They have a right to fulfill their purpose in nature, and they have a right to live freely in their habitat. Let's start by giving a good example with education and ecological culture for the new generations. Make them aware that these animals must be protected. And to keep them in captivity is to deny us the possibility of a world that is green and full of life.